Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or you just discovered the channel, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love, and make sure your notification bells are set to all, so that you don't miss a daily reminder of when I drop a video. If you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes, or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below. Also, from here on out, every video will have timestamps. I'm a little bit new to it, so just bear with me until I get all the placements rights and yada yada yada. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled true driving at night stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. When I was about 19, I was driving on a two-lane road after work at around 11 p.m. No other cars on the road, and suddenly, this guy in a red shirt on a bicycle swerved from the side of the road right in front of my car. I hit him. I felt the impact, too. I was repeatedly yelling, Oh. My. God. And got out of the car to see how badly he was hurt. Only... I didn't see him. I couldn't find the guy. No bike. No red-shirted guy. No dent or blood on my car. I searched the ditch with a flashlight. A couple of people passed by while I was looking in the field for a body when a sheriff's car pulled up. I told him what happened. He said I didn't hit anyone. He told me that about 15 years earlier, a young man in a red shirt was hit by a car while riding his bike there. He died instantly. Deputy told me that every couple of years, someone driving through there believes they've hit a red-shirted bike rider. I'd hit a ghost. It happened almost 40 years ago, and it still creeps me out. To this day, I do not like driving at night. Four years ago, I'm driving across the Colorado and New Mexico border at around 4 a.m., and I'm looking for a place to stop for fuel. I happened along the smallest and saddest little farm town with only one tiny gas station. I haven't seen another car for hours. It's freezing cold, and it felt like this town was abandoned. It was that quiet. Honestly, it was kind of cool, except for the cold. I'm pumping away, feeling like I'm completely alone, until I noticed another car in the shadows near the back of the building. Flashy black lowrider with completely tinted windows and four right out of a Mexican gangster movie looking guys leaning against it. I remember laughing because they startled the hell out of me and they were wearing the black shorts, white beater tank tops and the knee high socks. Remember, it was freezing cold. It was the middle of nowhere, and they looked so casual. Without a word, all four got off the car and walked straight towards me until I could see the full sleeves and face tattoos under the pump lights. Dropped the gas pump, fired up the motor, and did the greatest 1 to 100 that old girl had ever seen. Not 20 seconds after burning out onto the highway, I see headlights swerve out and follow me. Little did they know, my beat-up looking Dodge truck had the Hemi motor and a couple of upgrades. They never had a chance, and after a few miles, their headlights disappeared in my rearview mirror. I didn't think much of it, till a cop buddy told me about the Mexican cartels running drugs through there to avoid the interstate. I was left speechless.
A lot of people that drive for a living or have done balls-to-the-wall cross-country drives can tell you about the running shadows. First time I saw them, I was on the tail end of 12 straight hours of driving. I was driving through the middle of nowhere in the desert at night. Very little light from the sky. No man-made light even on the horizon. Just the pitiful cone from my truck's headlamp and being in the middle of the desert, it pretty much only lights up the road ahead. Nothing above ground level to catch the light. As I'm barreling along, I start to see shadowy figures running alongside my truck out of the corner of my eyes, on two legs, and four. All I can think about is these creepy stories you read online about shit that lives out in the desert or the Asian ghost stories where if you don't acknowledge the spirit, it can't harm you. So I've got my eyes glued to the road, refusing to let them flicker off to the side. I rolled my windows up and cranked up the volume on my radio. Drove like that for probably an hour and a half until they slowly petered out roughly 15 minutes outside of a little one-light town. I've had people try to carjack me. People try to rob me after I pull over to render aid. People jump out at me on twisty mountain roads, you name it. But nothing matches that level of fear for the first time that I saw them. Felt like my spine was rippling like a ribbon in the wind, trying to jump clear out of my back and hide under the seat. Sleep deprivation mixed with sensory deprivation does some strange things. It was 1977. I had taken time off work to have a baby and stay home with her. But I still needed, you know, an income. So my mother had hired my younger sister and me to do the dirty, back-breaking work in her shop while she took care of her first infant granddaughter. My sister and I were working at our mom's antique store one summer day. Mom had just gotten a truckload of European oak furniture that needed to be cleaned and polished, have the handles screw back on, so on and so forth. A nice-looking young man came into the store and started talking to my sister, who was 17 at the time. He introduced himself as Ted Smith, and we laughed and said we must be related, as Mom's maiden name was Smith also. He chatted both of us up, but focused on my sister for the most part. He purchased an armoire and said he'd have to go get his truck since at the moment he was only driving his Volkswagen Bug, an old Volkswagen Bug. He then asked my sister and me if we wanted to go out to dinner that night with him. We were sweaty and dirty from work. I had a baby to take care of, and sister also had a boyfriend, so we said, Thanks, but no thanks, Ted. He asked me to ride with him to get his truck so he could drop off his bug at the auto shop for repairs. But by that point, I had to get home to my infant right away because I was still nursing her and I thought my breasts were going to begin leaking at any minute. However, he wouldn't give up trying to get one or both of us away from the shop. He said he could come back at around 10 that evening for his arm wire and ask whether one of us will be there. We reply, No, we close the shop at 6 and we both have places to be tonight. He was persistent. How about tomorrow night? No, we close at 6, except on Saturdays when we close at 4. He asked whether one of us could meet him early in the morning at like 5.30 a.m., but neither of us wanted to. He was getting to be a bit creepy, and Sis and I were eye-rolling at each other. Eventually, he said he was sorry, but he couldn't buy the arm wire if we couldn't be flexible. We hated to give up the sale, but after he had been there for two hours, we thought he was just joking and taking up our time. We still had a lot of work to do on the furniture 
that had just arrived in the shop. Finally, we just wanted to finish our work and go home. After 6 p.m., as we were leaving, his Volkswagen Bug was parked outside, and he asked us whether we wanted to go for coffee. He especially wanted my sister to go. We said, thanks, Ted, but no thanks. Like we said earlier, we have plans. But he continued to be insistent. Finally, I said, sis, let's go. I'll take you home. Even though she had her own car there, for some reason, I didn't want to leave her to drive home alone with this guy around. So he drove off in his bug and we really didn't think of it again. Until the next year, when his picture appeared in the paper. Ted Bundy. It still sends chills up my spine writing this, and sister and I talk about it occasionally. We were two lucky women that day. If either of us had agreed to go, we would have been raped and murdered, like the at least 30 other women Bundy kidnapped. The creepiest on-road story I had was back in 2008, moving from Seattle to D.C. Route was down to Portland, then I-84 to I-80, to I-76, to I-70, to I-270. Immediately heading out of Portland, I passed an old F-100 going very slow in primer black with no license plates. Cool truck, I thought, and didn't really pay it no mind. I noticed that an hour later that that same truck was a couple car lengths behind me. That's odd. After getting back to some open roads, he disappeared into the distance behind me. First night I stopped somewhere in Idaho, shitty, cheap, local motel, and I'm the only one there. Wake up the next morning and parked one spot away from me is that primered F-150. Take off, continuing to trek southeast. Every single time I'd stop for gas at a rest stop or get slowed down for traffic, that old Ford shows up in my rear view mirror again. It's bizarre. Nearing the end of Nebraska, I pull over and get gas and decide to drive one more tank then stop for the day. Pull back into the highway, and Mr. Truck is right there shadowing me again. About 30 minutes later, I realize I'm too tired to get to the end of the tank and decide to stop in the next town, just over the border in Iowa. As I'm getting off, I see the pickup pass on, carrying down the highway. I guess he's got more endurance than I do. Wake up the next morning. You know what's coming. That damn truck is in the hotel parking lot again. Up to this point, I just figured I was driving hair to his tortoise, and we just happened to be making the same west to east trip. Now, I had the weird light feeling in my stomach, like something was just off. I asked the clerk when turning in my keys what's up with that truck when it had come in. She said she wasn't working last night and wasn't sure and also probably thought I was crazy, which maybe I was. Anyway, at that point, I figured it must be a coincidence, and this has to be a different truck. I mean, there were a lot of F-100s made, and there's bound to be a couple in the country that are primer black, running with no plates. As I go to head out, I see the truck turning out of the parking lot in the direction that leads him away from the highway couldn't have been the same one from before. The guy didn't turn in his keys, so he was probably staying locally. Get back to the highway, no truck. Run to the end of the tank stop and get gas and some snacks. Get back on, and I merged in two cars in front of a primer black F-150. What in the living hell? At that point, I decide, screw it. I'm marathoning the rest of the way. It's less than 20 hours, so it shouldn't be so bad. 
and I don't want to stay at another shitty motel with a strange ghost truck stalking me. The pattern continues with this truck showing up behind me every single time. I had to take a break or get gas or slowed in traffic. It's dark when I get to I-70 and the 270 split, and the old headlights are glowing back on the horizon. I know it's him. I wonder if it's going to follow me down 270 and be parked down the street near my house the next morning, especially when I wake up. Alas, the truck continues on 70. I never see it again. Looking back, it was probably a confluence or coincidence. It still feels really odd to me, though, because it's not like there was a lot of F-150s doing interstate runs in 2008. I also realized that I never got a good look at the driver. Not that there was no driver, but in my memories, all I see is an indistinct human-shaped thing driving an old truck that stalked me for 3,000 miles. This happened a couple of summers ago, as my boyfriend and I were driving along a remote forest service road in British Columbia, Canada, returning from a camping trip. We're very familiar with the area we were in, having camped there several times before. Typically, the only people we encounter out there, a good 70 kilometers from pavement roads, are fellow campers in off-road vehicles or logging truckers on the job. This particular day was beautiful, sunny, and warm, mid-June. We were bumping down the road at a good clip when we saw a man come out of the bush and begin frantically waving at us. It's very odd. We slowed down and came to a stop, with my boyfriend rolling down the window to see what the guy had to say. I was in the passenger seat, and as soon as we slowed down, I picked up a weird vibe. He was wearing a blue plaid construction worker's flannel coat, much too heavy for the warm weather, with khaki pants and work boots, was clean-shaven with messy gray-brown hair, pale skin, and large glasses. He was maybe about 50 years old. Let me stress how unusual it is to run into somebody way out there without a vehicle. The guy was fairly soft-spoken and calmly, almost robotically, told us that his car battery is dead. He asked us for a jump. Okay, sure, we believe in road karma and always want to help out people in trouble when we're out in the bush. But where's the car? He tells us that he's been fishing all day and had been playing his radio and it caused his battery to die. His car is down a very overgrown side road a little further up the main road. He walks ahead while we slowly follow him in our truck. Both my boyfriend and I were a bit weirded out, but we joke around to each other as we're following him that we hope he's not luring us into the bush to kill us. Except I legit felt on edge and the joke did not seem that funny. We followed him about 150 meters down the overgrown side road into a small, heavily treed area just wide enough for about four cars to park side by side. We never would have noticed this road if it hadn't been pointed out to us because bushes had nearly covered the entrance. Anyway, sure enough, there is a car there, an older model, a beige Chevy car that looks very unsuited to the rough logging roads. The trunk is open for some reason, and a blanket is draped over it. The hood was already popped on the car, so my boyfriend got out, grabbed our jumper cables from the back seat of our truck, and began affixing the cables to the car. Meanwhile, I swung my leg over the center console and slid into the driver's seat. 
I felt very uneasy and looked around the cab for anything that could be a weapon, all while telling myself I was being silly. But nonetheless, I wanted to be ready to act if something threatening did happen. The guy chatted with my boyfriend, jovially, telling him about his buddy who he is fishing with, but who went on ahead without him. But his friendliness seemed forced. He stood back, allowing my boyfriend to do everything, lingering behind him, watching while my boyfriend got the car batteries hooked up. There was an awkward pause, and my boyfriend had to prompt the guy to get into his car to crank it over. Throughout this, I sat in the driver's seat watching, feeling extremely tense. The car fired up easily, and the guy got back out of his driver's seat. He said thank you in an oddly intense way. My boyfriend removed the cables and hopped into the passenger seat without bothering to put the cables away properly. And the moment the passenger side door closed, I was reversing back down that narrow side road with branches scraping across both sides of our car. We got onto the main road within moments and went on our way. My boyfriend told me that the guy watched us the entire time as I backed down the road. Could have been just a socially awkward guy with a legitimately dead battery, but I can't help but to feel this guy's intentions were more sinister, and the fact that I stayed vigilant in the car, and that my boyfriend was efficiently competent with the jumper cables, helped us dodge a bullet. I'm not sure if the battery really was dead, because neither of us remember seeing any fishing gear. I got deployed to New Jersey just before the bitch Sandy showed up. For some reason, the powers that be decided it would be smart for us to have hotels in Neptune. It's on the Atlantic coast. But work in the State Emergency Operations Center in Trenton. See Pennsylvania side of NJ. The day before landfall, a co-worker, Mike, and I drove separately to Trenton, mainly because we had a van full of calm gear and no spare seats. Just before I left to go back to the hotel, I decided to grab a couple MREs from his van for when the power went out. As I was coming into the building to give him the keys, Governor Chris Christie was walking through the atrium of the building to give a press conference. I wasn't about to barge through his entourage to give the keys back to Mike, so I asked one of the other guys who was standing outside smoking to make sure Mike got the keys to the van as soon as he was done smoking. This was at about 6 p.m. the evening before landfall, and Sandy's outer bands were just starting to show up. At 9.30 p.m. that night, I got a call from Mike asking, Hey, where'd you put those van keys? Mike ended up working late that night. He was dealing with a lot of logistical stuff. And apparently the guy I gave the keys to didn't get them to Mike. By now, Sandy's winds were really kicking, but I told Mike I'd be there as soon as possible. When I had driven to Neptune earlier that night, I made an observation on I-195 Tons of tall trees on the sides of the road sand, open median, in the middle. It's a good thing I noticed and remembered that. Now, I've driven in a couple of hurricanes, and it's not that big of a deal, unless it's pitch blackout. Getting down to I-195 via the GSP wasn't bad. Some branches on the road, maybe a tree limb here and there. I'm not that stupid so I'm only doing about 40 miles per hour in the left lane once I'm on I-95 and then it happened. I literally yelled, What the fuck? Oh my God, holy shit, fucking hell! In the pitch black of the night, with the wind howling and the rain coming down, 
the top of the tree appeared in front of me. Luckily, it was about one to two feet into my lane. The other 30 plus feet of it was completely blocking the right lane. And I wasn't driving like an idiot. Lather, rinse, repeat about another dozen times on the way to Trenton. And at least another dozen, including one on a blind corner, on the way back to Neptune. The road trip took roughly four hours hours that night. Google is telling me it's 48 minutes one way right now. I changed my shorts when I got back into my powerless hotel and slept for about an hour when I was awoken by a phone call saying we needed to get to work ASAP because the president had declared the disaster. Thankfully, we only had to report to our alternate location near Neptune after that call and not Trenton. The time I was most scared behind the wheel was when I hit a dark object on a dark road at high speed, not knowing what I was about to hit. It was late at night, probably around midnight. Dark three-lane highway sparse traffic. I had been at a female friend's house, as was my usual weekend routine, about 90 miles from home. I had taken my oft-reliable but oil-consuming 1977 Firebird Esprit on the trip as I always had. Driving southbound on Highway 41 outside of Appleton, near the Nina Menasha exit, Yes, that's the same exit the band Sponge titled a song after. I was following an S Blazer in the middle lane when suddenly, brake lights. The S Blazer swerved hard left as a car had been in front of the Blazer, went hard right, and spun off the road down an embankment. This I did not much see. Why? Because in the center lane, dead ahead of me, was a large black rectangle. Focusing on that, my vision narrowed. My mind had few precious seconds to compile all the info around me and to guess at what I was about to run into and how not to. And there were, hmm, a few options. With a car outbreaking me to the left, the blazer, and a car spinning off the road to the right, whatever that was, I had to go straight and break and close my eyes. Was it a flipped over car? A garbage dumpster? What else would be on the highway in the middle of the wham? I made eye contact. It was loud, but not as loud as I would have thought. I opened my eyes. I was still slowing. I remember looking down at my speedo and seeing 50-ish. I had been doing about 70-ish. I let off the brake as I seemed to be out of harm's way, except for the awful, screechy, metally scraping noise. I shifted to neutral, shut off the engine, thinking something may have punctured the radiator, or the fan was now hitting it, causing the noise. Turned on the flashers, good old-fashioned pull knob, and made my way to the right shoulder. The blazer pulls up behind me. A lady gets out. Are you okay? She yells from her car as I exit my Firebird and look around to assess the situation. There is light traffic, now slowing, driving through a debris filled strewn across the highway. There is the blazer behind me and further back a tow truck, already on the side of the road, which is odd. I'm okay, I answer. You hit that thing head on, it blew apart. It was crazy. Mmm, hit what? I ask, still in shock and trying to register still what is going on exactly. The couch, you hit that couch. She points to the freeway. I focus on the debris and see cushions, wood, fabric, debris. I disseminated that shit. Yes. 
I made my way around the front of the car and see my headlights are no longer pointed straight. My hood is buckled, my composite material nose askew, and I see fluid dripping. Fuck. I kneel down and at this time, the tow driver approaches. I see metal under my car. It's the springs and frame from the couch. They are tangled into my transmission cooler lines, which have now been forcefully pulled out of the radiator. Ugh, fuck. Did you not say it there? Huh? The tow truck driver, who first noticed the couch getting dropped off someone's trailer, stopped and had just begun to shine his spotlight on it to warn traffic as we approached and took it out. Uh, no, there was a car in front, I mumble, still trying to understand all of this. I mean, this is my first accident and all. Where's that other car? He asks. We look down the embankment. There's a church with a car parked on the access road. There's a guy trudging through the weeds to climb up to us. He's okay. He actually hit the couch and knocked it to where it was before I hit it, before he spun off the road. So he says, his car is fine. The blazer is fine. My car is not. State Patrol arrives and assesses the situation, gets all of our information and starts to write out a report. Everyone is getting ready to leave and I cannot. I can't get the couch parts untangled from my car. I ask the tow truck driver, not for a tow, but just to lift it high enough so I could get under it and pull that shit out. I have tools. He obliges. I tip him and say thanks. Most of the debris had been cleared by state patrol and passing cars. I walk back to my car and see something waving in the wind. It's a small piece of batting stuck to my radio antenna. I take it off and put it in the glove box. I drive to the next exit, flipping on my high beams to see just how badly my lights were now misaligned. I brightened up the retaining wall, the street, the sky. I stop at the gas station off the exit and purchase a bottle of ATF and check my trans level. It's dripping, but it's not pouring out, even when running. Thankfully, there were some threads left and the line was not completely pulled out anymore. I limp home, stopping every once in a while to check the ATF level. It's good every time. Yay. I get home, park in my parents' driveway, and go straight to bed. I was visiting my girlfriend several hours northwest of Montreal, and the weekend was over, so I set out driving south on Auto Route 117 from Val d'Or in Quebec at about 2 a.m. on a Monday morning. Anyone who has driven the road knows just how bare it is and how isolated you are. It's not abnormal to speed excessively, as there are a few police officers. No cell reception, no gas station for about a 190 mile stretch, and emergency SOS phones every dozen miles or so. As mentioned, it was 2 a.m., and I was blasting down the highway, pushing my rental 2014 Hyundai Sonata to its limits. I'd downed two monsters and half a gallon of water nearly two hours earlier, and well, To ensure I stayed awake, I held off from the bathroom break until I finally needed one. Keeping an eye out for any roads or trails, I kept spotting flashes of light in the woods. It was a clear night with the full moon, so I just kept telling myself they were probably just highway markers set to close together and that if I pull over, there'd be no worries. After a good 20 minutes of stammering around trying to not soil the seat of the Sonata I was confined to for six more hours, I slammed on the brakes. 
a single dirt road, barely wide enough for an avio, but I decided to give it a shot. I was desperate. Rather than just stopping on the bare highway and doing my business, I pulled in and started to go through the trail, thanking myself for choosing the full coverage. Non-fault insurance as the bushes scraped and thwarted the sides of the car, and the bottom occasionally getting caught on a rock. After a few minutes, some fog started to set in, and the trail had gotten wider but muddier. I hit the gas and got through a half-foot deep mud pit and found a spot where I could stop and then turn around. I got out holding myself between the legs, leaving the car door open and fighting off the bugs to go pee across the trail. Oh my god. Yes, just fuck, yes. It was the best feeling in the world. I was overcome with glee and relief. But then, I hear a thud. Midstream, my car door had closed. It couldn't have just been nothing as I climbed up the bank to park so the door was held open by gravity. But I shrugged my shoulders and told myself it was the wind even though there was none. I reached in my pocket to double check I had the key fob, which I did, and my cell phone as well. And for some reason, I started to feel a tingling on the back of my neck. And I looked up. More road markers. But on the trail, in the fog, in the woods, there were eyes. First one pair, then three. I zipped up and ran to the car. But the car was locked. I left it unlocked, and the door open. What was happening? I turned around, and there's these three wolves staring at me, with my dress shirt sticking out of my fly. Two terrifying things. Number one, the wolves in front of me. Number two, I just tore my Hugo Boss dress shirt. I clicked the key fob button in my pocket, unlocked the door, and calmly stepped in. Holy shit. Finally, some sheet metal between me and the wolves. I was sweaty. I dribbled on my work pants and tore my shirt. Great. At least I was safe, though. I went to start the car, and it wouldn't fucking start. Nothing. No turnover or anything. This was a brand new 2014 Sonata, and I was the first renter. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my phone. After a few tries with nothing, and as I mentioned, there's no reception, no police, almost no traffic, and I am in the middle of a freaking ATV trail, and my car wouldn't start. What's next? Bats. That's what. Fucking bats. There were fucking bats in the car. Now, I'm sitting in this car with my phone screen on, unable to call 911, and several bats flying around me, and three wolves still outside my car, staring at me, make a fool out of myself. Panicking, I decided to start swatting the bats. Have you ever swatted bats? This was the first for me. But man, it is disgusting. It's furry and greasy at the same time, and you feel their skin on yours too. Throw in the fact they're trying to bite and scratch you, and they can practically see in the dark. After a well-fought battle, I just... I got enough of them on the ground that I could try and start the car again. I inched my door open a crack, reclosed it to reset the lights, and tried the key again. It worked. Oh my god, hell yes, home free. I shoved it into drive, turned the wheel left, honked at the wolves, and mashed it to get the car turned around. I started heading back down the trail, but suddenly, there's a half a dozen wolves chasing me from behind, and I open the window to get the bats out. I reach the highway with everything clamoring around, the car banging anything it could, and bats flying out every window. 
too preoccupied with a pack of wolves chasing me and bats still flying around, I didn't notice the semi-truck headed north and flew right on to the highway, crossing his path, and I'd just missed getting hit by a mere few inches. I almost shat my seat. Again. I continued to drive south, fighting off the bats at 30 miles per hour to get away from the wolves, and finally they were gone. I closed up the windows, sped up to a speed that isn't exactly legal, trying to catch my breath to make sense out of what just happened. For five hours, I drove in silence, until I arrived to a parking lot near work in downtown Montreal. Bloodied with bat shit on me, smelling like urine, a torn shirt still sticking through my fly. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. <laughs> okay. Muddied dress shoes, exhausted and panicked, I walked into the office to start my Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy. <laughs> Back to our narration. I'm sorry. One night, I'm out getting gas, and after I leave, I pull up to a red light behind a beater car. We are both turning right onto a two-lane highway. We both make the right. His car doesn't go very fast, so I head for the left lane. He blocks me. I head for the right lane. He immediately kills his signal and cuts me off again. This continues for a little while before I get annoyed, gun it, and go to pass him. Again, while in the process of passing, this guy takes a dive at my car, which slows me down. He's yelling out of his window, You aren't passing me, motherfucker, and starts laughing maniacally. We get caught at another light, and he starts chucking stuff at my car. I check the traffic and gun it through the red. I'm sufficiently creeped out now. His car seems to be faster than I initially thought, and he is keeping up with me, through traffic. In desperation, I start turning off side streets, and he is following me. We get to another light, and I ask what his problem is, and he screams, literally screams, you're going to die tonight. Okay, holy fuck. So I chuck an old coffee into his car, turn off my lights, and take the fuck off as fast as I can go. At this point, stoplights aren't a concern anymore. I want to be pulled over. I'm ripping through little towns at 100 miles per hour and 25 and 30 miles per hour zones. And starting to lose him, finally duck into another side street, somehow found a driveway that goes next to a garage, pulled up next to the garage, lights off, car was still on, and wait. One minute, three minutes, ten minutes. I finally get home about 45 minutes later, white as a ghost, called the police, didn't have my cell at the time, and reported him. I never found out what happened. I never saw him again. Literally thought I was going to be murdered for absolutely nothing. Spring break, 1997. I was heading out to Houston from Habak and looking forward to a nice week of doing nothing. With a few stops, the drive should take about roughly eight and a half to nine hours. The plan was to stop in Austin for the night at a good friend's house and head out to Houston, two and a half hours, in the morning. For the record, I'm driving an 85 Sentra hatchback. No AC, no cruise control. Thanks, Dad. Due to work commitments, I couldn't leave Lubbock until about 
6 p.m. I stopped at a friend's house for a quick bite before hitting the road. It's now 7 p.m. The drive itself was very uneventful until I get to Austin. At 12.30 a.m., I reach Austin and find a bank of payphones before the era of everyone having a cell phone. I called him to say, I'm not tired, really, gonna make the short drive to Houston. He says, are you sure? It's pretty late, man. Yeah, I'm good. Call you in the morning when I'm in H-Town. I hang up and filled up the tank before heading out again. It's now 1 a.m. At 2.30 a.m., I reach Brenham and can barely keep my eyes open. I'm doing every trick in the book. Loud music, window open, slapping face, punching myself. Nothing's working. Just past Brenham on 290 is a combination levee and bridge highway designed to keep the freeway high and dry during big floods. The last thing I remember was closing my eyes and opening them suddenly to see my car plunging down the levee with me inside. I must have been doing 60 to 70 miles per hour when I went downhill. Luckily, the high grass kept me from either overturning or nailing the bottom of the levee. So, I stopped at about 15 feet from the bottom of the levee. It's the middle of the night, and no one can see my car down the embankment. No cell phone. No witnesses. Car won't start. Fuck. After a quick check on myself, I get out of the car and stumbled out the driver's side door. I start climbing up to the levee to flag down someone to help. Yeah, right. People are just gonna stop when they see some Mexican-looking fellow waving his arms in the middle of nowhere at 2.45 a.m. Finally, an 18-wheeler stops and I borrow his cell phone. I call my dad, who's unsure of what to do. Thanks, Pops. Then call a wrecker to pull my car out. The trucker offers to wait until the wrecker arrives, but I get really creeped out just sitting there, so I say, uh, yeah, I'm good. I'll, I'll wait over here by the side of the road. The trucker leaves, and I'm all alone again. After a few minutes, I realize that I'll probably be waiting for an hour for the wrecker, so I decide to get back in my car and see if I can't throw it in reverse. I'm not sure if I had an angel on my shoulder, but the car fired right up. As I threw it into reverse, it truly felt like a Christmas miracle. All the way up the embankment, I drove backwards and made it to the top by the side of the freeway. Got out and checked everything. Wheels? Okay. Body damage? Nothing too noticeable. Engine? Looks like the underneath of a lawnmower. But... It all looks okay. Belts are still belting. Let's go. Put it in first gear, and I hear a wobble from the wheels. Not sure what it is, but nothing is going to stop me from making it to Houston, damn it. My top speed after the accident was about 40 miles per hour. I reached my parents' house at about 5 a.m., tired, sore, and still a bit in shock. I told my parents what happened before I collapsed in my bed. After I woke up sometime around noon, I went to survey the damage. I had completely stripped two of the four lug nuts off the right wheel and one lug off the left wheel. I'm damn lucky that one or both wheels didn't fly off the car after my accident. I also realized that if I had gone off 15 seconds later, my car would probably have been upside down in that creek. So, yes, never pass up a chance to sleep during a long road trip. Back on Labor Day weekend, I had a homeless man very literally run out into traffic in front of me. I was going through a stoplight intersection in a marked 35 zone. 
He ran out in front of the car that was turning left from the same direction from traffic as me. I hit him with my driver's quarter panel at a full skid at about a 45 degree angle. Have you ever had a person come through your windshield so hard their head comes within inches of your face? Yeah, it's terrifying. Getting out and seeing a man with two compound fractured legs and bleeding from multiple orifices on his head. Scariest experience of my life involving a car or not. The only silver lining of it all, I was 100% cleared by security footage on a nearby business. Didn't even get a ticket. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true driving at night stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge and give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Doba Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Without you, there wouldn't be a me, and there definitely wouldn't be a BTA channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.